our afternoon service for Yom Kippur, the Mincha service, always focuses on Yona. Sefer Yona contains a narrative we all know. Many of us learned of it as small children, but possibly we do not fully appreciate or comprehend it. More important still is its relevance for us on this Yom Kippur afternoon. Yona, whose name means dove, lived in the Galilean city of Gat Hefer, about four miles north of Nazareth. He lived during the reign of Jeroboam II, which is approximately 793 to 753 BCE. Uh, he was the northern kingdom's most powerful king. We read about uh, Jeroboam II in Melachim Beit 14, verse 25. During his reign, the borders of the northern kingdom were expanded to their greatest extent, However, Assyria, 500 miles to the east, was a constant threat. Patriotic sons of Israel longed for Assyria's destruction. Because of Israel's rebellion, God had declared through prophets Hoshea and Amos, uh, who were contemporaries of Yonah, all of whom we have been studying in the Twelve, that he would use Assyria as an instrument of chastening his people. And so one can hardly imagine the consternation that must have filled Yonah's heart when he received Hashem's instruction to proceed to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, with a divine message. Yona is not the only reluctant servant of God in the scriptures. Even Moshe, the greatest of our prophets, attempted to persuade God to send someone else. Yeshiahu, who was already a Kohen, had to be challenged first before he was willing to speak to our people for God. Gideon had to have proof that God was really choosing him. Many people called by God have been reluctant. We hear only of those who agreed to serve God. Yonah is the best example of one who tried unsuccessfully to escape God's purposes. Are you like Yona? Well, the focus of the narrative of this book is Yona's relationship with Hashem. Not only did Yona disobey God's direct command to go to Nineveh, he then tried to run away from God. He took a ship to Tarshish. Tarshish, probably in Sepharad in Spain. <clears throat> in other words, he... Um, he decided to go as far away from where he thought God was as he could. Did Yona really think his escape plan would work? That he could somehow run away from God's presence? Why did he run? Why was that necessary? He could just say no. A storm came up, and when the storm rain, raged, the sailors asked him from what people he came. He freely admitted that he was a Hebrew, and he added, and this is really interesting, 
I worship Adonai, the God of heaven, who made both the sea and the land. Isn't that the God he's trying to run away from? And if Fiona understood that God was the creator of the world, how could he have expected to run away from God successfully? Well, logically, he couldn't. And maybe that's the point. God had given Yona, who was known to be a prophet of Hashem, a specific mission, one that Yona desperately wanted to avoid. In his desperation to run from God's purpose for his life, he tried to do what he had to know was impossible, to find a place where God's commands and God's presence could not reach him. It's easy for us to criticize Yona, and some even mock and belittle him, but don't we all at some time do the same thing? Perhaps it is difficult to live every moment of our lives conscious of God's presence. So sometimes we act as if we don't know that God's presence is unavoidable. We may not attempt to physically flee from God, but we too seek to find some place that is, at least metaphorically, far from his presence. Yonah's answer to the sailors is noteworthy because this is the only place in the Tanakh where a person is recorded as referring to himself as an Ivri, a Hebrew. But what did he mean and why did he say that? One opinion is that he referred to those who came originally Me'ever, Hanakar, from the other side of the river. This, of course, is a reference to Avraham's origins in Mesopotamia. Perhaps Yonah used Ivri ironically, meaning one who has crossed, suggesting that he was, in a sense, reversing Avraham's journey. Avraham crossed the river to follow God. Yonah sought to cross the sea in order to escape him. But when confronted by the raging sea and the innocent sailors whose lives he recognized he had endangered, Yona reversed his own course by telling the sailors to cast him overboard. Yona transformed himself from one who was trying to pretend that God could be escaped to one who was placing himself completely in God's hands. In his prayer from inside the fish, Yona recognized his complete dependence upon God. In my trouble, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Yona experienced a kind of transformation one which I believe we strive for on this day of Yom Kippur. As part of his prayer, Yonah says to God, You cast me into the depths, into the heart of the sea. Well, that's not exactly accurate, but nonetheless, we get a feeling for what has happened to him. In the small section from the end of Sefer Micha that we append to Sefer Yona to complete our reading for the Minka service, we use almost identical language to describe what we seek from God. 
you will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. The connection between Yona's journey and our own is highlighted by this reading of the HaTorah itself. But the narrative of Yona's journey is for us one of hope. Yona tried to run from God's call on his life, but in the midst of the storm, he changed course. We too try to escape God's commands. Perhaps you've worked very hard in the last year to do just that, that but by living a, a life which you know is in opposition to God's express commands. In the midst of the storms that so often seem to characterize our lives, especially when we run from God's calling, we too have the choice to change course. And that is what Teshuvah, return, repentance, is all about. Yona should remind us of the central message of Yom Kippur. However far we may run from God and from his plans for us. We are only one step away from returning to him. May each one of us have the courage to take that step, that returning step, right now. Do you believe that God is able to deliver you from whatever is keeping you from full repentance? To deliver you to what he wants to do in and with your life? What are you experiencing? Is it, is it lack of faith? Perhaps prayerlessness? Poor time management, which seems to mean that you arrive late for services or don't make them at all, uh, fail to spend any kind of time with God on a daily basis, forget everything that you intend or you say you intend to do in regard to reading the scriptures, praying, sinful desires, wrong relationships, spiritual powerlessness, hopelessness, negativity, regrets, the hold of the past. God is able to lift you up and draw you away from anything and everything standing in the way of what he desires for you his best for you. The question is, what do you want? Are you still trying to run away from God, to do your own thing? Or have you learned your lesson? That's what happened to Yona. You can be delivered by sincere repentance. And here, for a moment, we want to look at the city of Nineveh. Nineveh was one of the, the earliest cities of the ancient world. It was founded by Nimrod, according to Bereshit 10, who was a grandson of Noach. And it endured in six, until 612 BCE. It was located along the banks of the mighty Tigris River, opposite the site of the modern city of Mazul in Iraq. It was the capital of the great Assyrian Empire, lying north of Babylon 
in a more hilly terrain. Nineveh's fortunes changed with the ongoing conflict between the Assyrian and the Babylonian empires. Among the great kings of Assyria were Tiglath Pileser I, Asher Nasserpal, Shalmaneser, Sennacherib, and Sargon II. Maybe you're not familiar with any of these names, but the remains of the great palace of Sargon II may be seen, along with those of Asher Nasserpal II in the British Museum, along with other discoveries from Nineveh. Although the scriptures record specific information about Nineveh, believe it or not, until the mid-19th century, most historians believed that Nineveh was a myth, just like Babylon, until archaeologists looked where the Bible said it would be, and amazingly, there it was. But what about the people of Nineveh? War and conquest were actually the, the core, the center of their culture. And they were very, very harsh with their enemies. They worshipped a national deity, Asher, but also they worshipped Babylonian deities with their cultic character and, and also the gods of Sumer and Akkadia. The people were wicked. They were immoral, they were evil, they were unjust, and they were viciously cruel. Of all the peoples of the ancient world, the Ninevites were the least likely to look kindly upon a son of Israel who had come to tell them that they were going to be destroyed by his God. But Jonah was given a message for the people of Nineveh. This was the message. He was told by God to go to these enemies of Israel and tell them that his God, the God of a small, largely powerless nation, would destroy their city in 40 days. That was his message. Yonah didn't want to go. He undoubtedly feared for his physical well-being among these cruel people, but he also feared that the people of Nineveh might actually repent of their wickedness. Why else would God bother to command him to take this message to them? Why not just destroy them? He feared that God might be merciful to a people he didn't believe deserved God's mercy. But then, who does? Jonah's message was not one of forgiveness and salvation, of mercy and of grace. It was not. It was a message of decisive judgment without options. The sins of Nineveh had been weighed by the God of Israel, and he had decided that they would now pay for their evil ways. God had examined the evidence, and he found them guilty, as with Persia later. Remember the handwriting on the wall. And so the Ninevites were to receive their just desserts in only 40 days. The cup of Nineveh's iniquity had been filled to the brim, and it was now overflowing, and God said, enough is enough. But the people of Nineveh, these pagans and idolaters, believed God. They believed God. Do you believe God? Well, first, these wicked people had to believe in the God of Israel. And then they had to accept that this God 
was in fact in a position to judge and to destroy them. And thirdly, they had to accept Yonah as God's representative, which they did without question or debate. Finally, they had to believe God could and would do what he said, that he was omnipotent, not merely the God of Israel, but sovereign over their nation as well as Israel. Having believed God, the people of Nineveh made the choice to act promptly. They didn't go to their their gods and ask for help. They didn't say, let's eat, drink, and be merry for the next 40 days and then we'll die. Let's poke our fingers in God's eye and enjoy our wickedness until the end. That's what they did in Persia. Even before their king heard the news, the people had begun to repent. They demonstrated their repentance in recognized Jewish ways by fasting and prayer, mourning, putting on sackcloth and ashes. And when this Goyesha king heard the words of Yonah, He confirmed these acts and he declared that neither human nor animal should eat or drink, but afflict themselves and cry unto the God of Israel for mercy. That they should acknowledge their guilt in the light of God's standards given to Israel. They knew, they knew that they must turn from their evil ways. They knew their ways were evil. And they should seek God's forgiveness and favor. Not their gods, the God of Israel. They could not be certain that the God of Israel would accept these acts as sufficient to annul his decree that Nineveh should be destroyed. But they, as a people, threw themselves on God's mercy, trusting that this was possible. And what was God's response? Here we see the Rakamim of our God revealed even to pagans. God saw and he heard the voices and actions of the whole city. The entire city repented en masse. God heard their supplications and entreaties. He saw that they had turned from their evil ways and their idolatry. He knew their hearts. He knew that this was not a mere outward show for the sake of a reprieve, but a true change of heart, a change of lifestyle, a change of attitude, as well as of action. God had not offered any possibility of a remission for their sins, but he was willing to receive true repentance based on Torah. But the people of Nineveh had never been given the commandments of God. No, they hadn't. But they knew what was needed to do to repent before the God of Israel and in accordance with his commandments. They knew. God has given no other commandments before or since. And the response of the Ninevites clearly demonstrates that God's commandments given to Israel are intended for all those who seek his favor. God is always willing to forgive if one comes in repentance and obedience on the basis of God's righteous standards. And so God renounced 
the planned judgment on the basis of his mercy. He is the righteous judge, Adonai Tzidkenu, just in all his ways. He loves those he has created, and he seeks to draw them back to himself if they are willing to come on his terms. He is not willing that any should perish. As he forgave Yonah for running from his avodah, his service to God, so he forgave the citizens of Nineveh. What has God shown us? Anything that falls short of God's perfection is sin, both what we do and what we fail to do. Our sin and our sinful propensity, evil inclination, separates us from a relationship with God. Separation from God cannot be overcome by human acts. Only God himself could provide the bridge which would allow us to do to Shiva, to return and be reconciled with him. Because God has loved us, really loved us from the beginning, and because we are his creation, he offers the only atonement providing unconditional pardon. If we confess our sin and come in true repentance, Hashem is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And through the blood of Mashiach Yeshua, he will cleanse us from all acts of unrighteousness. On the other hand, unconfessed sin leads to separation from God, which is precisely what Hasatan desires as he leads us down that slippery but wide slope to our destruction. God requires us to do three things so that he might draw us back into right relationship with him. We must practice self-denial through fasting, coming in humility before God. We must set aside this day to approach God in humility and repentance. And we must acknowledge God's provision of Mashiach's sacrifice for sin. The atoning substitutionary act of Mashiach Yeshua makes it possible for us to come to God and receive pardon for sin. The sin that polluted our lives is washed away, leaving us clean and pure before God. As surely as it is impossible to retrieve the crumbs scattered into the flowing water at Tashlik, just as surely our sins are removed from God's sight. Your sins, past and present, Everything fed by the evil inclination that causes pain and worry, anguish and wrongdoing. Take them away. Lay them before Hashem. Let everything go just as you released the crumbs last week when you did Tashlik. As with the people of Nineveh, there must be first a recognition of sin and its consequences. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. We approach God in an attitude of humility and repentance. We seek his forgiveness and remind him of his promised mercy. And we receive God's pardon through the sacrifice of Mashiach Yeshua. The narrative of Nineveh demonstrates 
God's willingness to forgive even the most hardened and wicked of people. God's express will is that all should come to repentance. God desires your repentance. As we conclude this day with our final Nila service, prepare your hearts, your minds, prepare to live righteously with a heart dedicated to Hashem. Sow seeds of holiness and reap a harvest of faith, peace, and joy. Israel, put your hope in Adonai. Grace is found with Adonai and with him unlimited redemption. He will redeem Israel from all their sins. Return to God in repentance so that you might be clothed in garments of righteousness, humility, and holiness.